Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, I really appreciate this turnout, and I appreciate everyone taking the time to um, uh, come in here in Enrique Morones. I'm Matthew Kay. I'm the director of the Office of Volunteer Programs and Service Learning. Uh, and uh, we've sponsored this um, uh, program, but primarily the sponsor is La Spanidad. Um, the members of La Spanidad, it's a student club. Are you guys here? Will you stand up or just wave your hand or something? They're all back there. So they're the, they're the ones that uh, um, approached and said, you know, we really want to do things about um, immigration in the United States. It's a hot topic. And we want to talk about um, the DREAM Act. We want, we want the students um, on campus to know that these issues are important, not just to us here, but to the nation um, and to multiple nations, actually. So um, I really appreciate you guys being here. I want to introduce you to Christian Colon. Um, come on up, Christian. And who's your friend, Christian? <laughs> Hector. All right. Hector. Um, they're going to introduce in, in Enrique. Um, uh, if you could just really quickly grab your phone. Um, there's a little button on the side. If you push it, it makes it not sing. Um, that would be great. Uh, and also, um, if you'll be patient too, uh, the way we're going to format this today is very simple. Uh, we're getting started at 2 o'clock, right on the dot. Enrique said he's going to do a presentation. It's going to be about 45 minutes. And then he's going to take questions and answers, and I'll facilitate that. Um, then he's going to hang out. So if you've got a 3 o'clock class, we're going to get you out of here to go to your 3 o'clock class. And I really appreciate it. So if you'll just stay patient, um, and I'll give Enrique the high sign once we get about 2.50, and he's really still going at it. But um, all right, here's Christian. All right. All right, welcome, you guys. Uh, Hector's going to start first. He's going to introduce uh, everyone in Spanish. So here we go. Hello, my name is Hector Gutierrez. Um, I'm an executive board of La Hispanidad here at Sacred Heart. Primeramente, quiero dar las gracias por estar aquí en esta tarde. Es un honor para mí estar aquí en este día y presentarles a un individuo que ha impactado a toda la comunidad latina. Él creció en la Ciudad de México y luego se mudó para San Diego en el año de 1954. Aunque él fue el primer miembro de su familia que nació en los Estados Unidos, él también fue la primera persona en haber aplicado y ser aceptado por una ciudadanía mutua con México. Por más de 20 años, él ha sido la voz de los inmigrantes en ambas partes de la frontera entre Estados Unidos y México. En 1979 se graduó de la Universidad de San Diego y luego obtuvo su grado de maestría en liderazgo ejecutivo. Su inspiración no tan solo viene de sus creencias católicas en servir a los otros, pero también de su abuelo Luis N. Morones, el cual fue uno de los fundadores del Movimiento de Labor en México. En 1987, él fundó Ángeles de la Frontera, que es una organización sin ánimo de lucro. Los voluntarios promueven los derechos humanos, la reforma migratoria y justicia social con un enfoque especial en temas relacionados a la frontera entre México y Estados Unidos. Además de trabajar en su organización, él ha tomado muchos puestos de liderazgo durante su vida. En 1995, él estableció el Departamento de Mercado Hispano en el equipo de Grandes Ligas de la Pelota, los San Diego Padres. Esta fue la primera vez que un departamento como este existió en las Grandes Ligas del Béisbol. El trabajo de más de 600.000 fanáticos latinos para apoyar al equipo. Él luego se convirtió en el único vicepresidente latino de los San Diego Padres. En 1996, él se convirtió en el presidente de la Cámara de Comercio en el municipio de San Diego. Bajo su liderazgo, en menos de un año, la ciudad aumentó sus negocios latinos, de 100 a más de 850. Él fue nombrado como uno de los 100 latinos más influyentes de los Estados Unidos por Latino Impact y la revista Hispanic Business Magazine. Es un honor presentarles a Enrique Morones. Now in English. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Christian Colon and I am the co-president of La Hispanidad, our Latino club here on campus. I want to first thank you all for coming today. It is an honor for me to stand here today and introduce an individual who has impacted the Latino community as a whole. For many years, his courageous actions in standing up for Latinos all over the country have caused, changed um, their view towards immigration. He is an individual who grew up in Mexi Mexico City and later moved to San Diego in 1954. Although he was the first member of his family to be born in the United States, he was also the first person to ever apply and be granted dual citizenship with Mexico. For more than 20 years, he has been the voice of immigrants on both sides of the United States-Mexican border. In 1979, he graduated from the University of San Diego and later pursued a master's degree in executive leadership. 
His inspiration derives not only from his Roman Catholic beliefs and serving others, but also from his grandfather, Luis Morones, who was one of the founders of the labor movement in Mexico. In 1987, he founded Border Angels, which is an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization that advocates for human rights, humane immigration reform, and social justice with special focus on issues related to the U.S.-Mexican border. Other than working with his organization, he has taken many leadership roles throughout his life. In 1995, he established the Department of Hispanic Marketing with the Major League Baseball team, the San Diego Padres. This was the first time ever a department like this existed in the MLB. He brought over 600,000 Latino fans to support the Padres. He later became the first, oh, he later became the first only Latino vice president of the San Diego Padres. In 1996, he became the president of the San Diego County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Under his leadership, in less than a year, the city went from 100 to over 850 Latino-owned businesses. Latino Impact and Hispanic Business Magazine named him one of the most, 100 most influential Latinos in USA as well as he is the first recipient of Mexico's National Human Rights Award. He currently resides in San Diego and lives by Matthew 23, 35. When I was hungry, did you give me to eat? When I was thirsty, thirsty did you give me to drink? Please welcome Enrique Morones. Assalamu alaikum. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Shalom. Uh, I'm going to show, we're going to show a short video, only three minutes, I think it is, or two minutes, to kind of get you in the mood of what we do as the Border Rangers. And one thing that I wanted to clarify, I wasn't uh, born in Mexico City in 1954. My family moved from Mexico City in 1954 to San Diego. I was actually born in San Diego. And I'm very proud to be 100% Mexican, born in San Diego, and I'm the same race as all of you, a member of the human race. And so we want to show this video, kind of get you in the mood about what we do, and to not only promote Matthew 25, 35, but also to promote the fact that a society is judged on how we treat our children. Thank you, and thank you, Matthew, and, and the University of Sacred Heart, Hispanidad, and all of the people that were involved in bringing me here, and especially thank you to all the students that, that are here today. Um, I'm briefly going to talk to you about uh, Border Angels, border realities and immigration today, and what is happening with immigration today. So as mentioned, uh, my name is Enrique Morones, and I'm the uh, founder and the executive director of Border Angels or Angeles de la Frontera. And Border Angels is an organization that got started back in 1986, way long before most of you were born. And in 1986, it was a totally different world than what we have going on today. In 1996, ni excuse me, 1986, there was no wall between the United States and Mexico. You saw that wall up there with children on, on either sides of it. Uh, we had a whole different situation going on in many cases, and in many cases, we had the same situation going on. In 1986, a friend of mine from the great country of El Salvador said, Enrique, you're oftentimes collecting things to try to help the most needy. Matthew 25, 35, if I was hungry, did you give me to eat? If I was thirsty, did you give me to drink? And I said, yeah, I go, a lot of people do that. So what? And she said, well, you never come to my neighborhood where I live. And I go, well, where do you live? And she said, I live in Carlsbad. And for those of you familiar with San Diego, you have areas like that here in, San, in, in Connecticut as well. Carlsbad's a very wealthy area. And I said, why would you need help in Carlsbad? I'm talking about my neighborhood. I, worked, I, I grew up in a working class neighborhood like many of you. And she said, no, but where I live in Carlsbad, there's migrants that live in the canyons. I go, what do you mean? And she goes, yeah, they live outdoors. And so I went up there, and I could not believe that there was people living outdoors 24-7, and these people are the people that work in the fields. These people are the people that were working in the strawberry fields in, in San Diego. They were working in the tomato fields in San Diego. They were working in the flower fields in San Diego. Because San Diego is one of the largest cities in the country, and it's on the southern border with Mexico in California, which is the eighth most powerful economy in the world. If California were a country, it'd be the eighth most powerful economy in the world. And the number one industry, the number one industry in California is agriculture. It feeds many of you. And 80% of the workers in the fields are undocumented, are undocumented. And at one time in your family's history, you were those people 
living in the canyons, working in the fields, because it's happened to all of us in our history, uh, regardless of what part of the world you're in. So in 1986, I went to those canyons, I saw these people living in these situations, and I said, we need to do something about this. And the person that is going to do something about this and the person that's going to make the most change in the world is that person you look at in the mirror every day. So I started going to those canyons back in 1986. The microphone seems a little fuzzy. Can you guys hear me okay? Can you hear? Yeah. So anyways, so in, in uh, 1986, I started going to those canyons. And I couldn't believe. I saw children like that and families living, and I was heartbroken. You know, I said I wanted to do something about it. So that's how it all started. In the early 90s, is the only time in my life I didn't live in San Diego, the city of my birth. I moved to Los Angeles. And what's happening right now in Ferguson, Missouri, in Cleveland, Ohio, in New York, was happening in Los Angeles, California. And it's still happening today. There was a young African-American man that was pulled over by law enforcement, and he was almost beat to death. That was not the unusual part. The unusual part, and sadly, nowadays, that still continues to happen, but a lot of them are actually killed, which is horrific. But actually what happened was Rodney King was pulled over by the Los Angeles Police Department and almost beat to death, and the unusual part was that it was caught on film. You've seen a lot of these incidents now caught on film, but back then there was no cell phone cameras. Video cameras were brand new. They didn't even have cell phones. So this guy taped Rodney King being almost beat to death, and there was riots in the streets of Los Angeles, like we see what's taking place in the country. Because people are standing up and saying, we've had enough. We've had enough. We're not going to tolerate this. So I did a big event in Los Angeles with a couple of friends of mine called Reencuentro, to reconnect and to promote the idea that one of my uh, great heroes taught me, Dr. Martin Luther King, that we're all the same race, the human race. And to take action, don't be silent, do something about it in a peaceful manner. So I did this big event at the Los Angeles uh, Convention Center. And this guy that we were going to honor, another hero of mine, had just passed away. But we honored him anyways. Some of you have never heard of him. Some of you have heard of him. He was the co-founder of the United Farm Workers to unionize the farm workers. His name is Cesar Chavez. So Cesar Chavez had just passed away, but his wife, Elena, came. And when Elena came, she came with a woman that said, Enrique, I wanted, I've been wanting to meet you. I heard about your work in the canyons in San Diego. And I don't understand why you don't talk about it, but I wanted to meet you. And I said, you need no introduction. You're one of the uh, families that I've admired my whole life. And she comes from the most powerful Catholic family in the country. It was Ethel Kennedy. Ethel Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy's wife. And Senator Kennedy, her husband, was assassinated in 1968, the same year that Martin Luther King was assassinated, Martin, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King. So she said, I see that compassion. I see that drive. Have you thought about moving back to San Diego? And I said, I have and I will. So I moved back down to San Diego in 1994. And in 1994, when I moved back down to San Diego, four things happened that have greatly, greatly impacted immigration today. And those four things are the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which allows commerce to cross borders, but not people. So the Walmarts of the world become bigger, and the people that live off the land can no longer live off the land because in, in Mexico, for example, if you happen to be from the great uh, state of Veracruz, where coffee is very prevalent, U.S. coffee was cheaper in Veracruz than Mexican coffee from Veracruz. So as a person that works in the field, picking coffee beans, I can no longer compete. So there's a big migration north. And like I said, all of our families have been those people working in the fields at one time in our history. So that's one thing that happens, NAFTA. Another thing that happens, was the Zapatista movement. Subcomandante, Subcomandante Marcos ro rose up and said, hey, we indigenous people have rights too. The most beautiful blood that we have is that indigenous blood. And he said, we have rights too, and there's a big migration north. So you have the Zapatista movement, you have NAFTA. You have a very racist bill, a very racist bill that was proposed in California and actually passed in California. It was called Proposition 187. And Proposition 187 would deny the children of undocumented people the right to go to school or receive health care. Now, what fault is it of the children that their parents brought them across the border the only way they could, without papers, because there's no visas for these people. So when people say, oh, they should get a line, there is no line. There is, if you're not at a certain income level, you're not going to qualify to get a visa, so they risk their lives crossing the desert. So. Proposition 187 would deny the children of undocumented people the right to go to school 
or receive health care. I'm talking people the age of your little brothers and sisters. Why is it their fault? But the Constitution of California says you cannot do that. That's discrimination. So it was never implemented. It was never implemented, so we never had um, Proposition 187. But that was the temperament of the state. And the fourth thing that happened in 1994 was this great country, which in the 1980s had said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. The United States built their own wall, Operation Gatekeeper. Operation Gatekeeper, the wall between the United States and Mexico. There's 2,000 miles of border between the United States and Mexico, from San Diego to Brownsville, Texas. That's 2,000 miles. A third of that border has wall. Wherever there's cities, there's a wall. San Diego, Tijuana, Calexico, Mexicali, Laredo, Laredo, Brownsville, Matamoros, etc. Where there's no cities, there's no wall. And that's where the people cross. They cross where there's no wall, and people die every day. People die every day simply because they want to live, they want to provide for their family, or they want to be with their family and they risk their lives. 11,000 people have died because of Operation Gatekeeper. 11,000 human, human beings have died. 11,000. And that is not only a number, those are 11,000 individuals, like Marco Antonio Villaseñor. Marco Antonio Villaseñor was a five-year-old little boy that crossed with his dad for the number one reason people crossed from Latin America to the United States. His dad wanted to feed his family a universal human right. So he wanted to find work in the United States and he crossed with his son. As he crossed with his son, his son became very thirsty. So his son asked his dad for some water. And the father would not give the son any water. So he asked the next man and the next man and the next man and the, he asked 18 men for water. 18 men. Neither of them would give the five-year-old little boy water. And why not? They were already dead. The father was dead, the other 17 men were dead, and Marco Antonio Villaseñor also died. 19 human beings perish. A five-year-old little boy with a red t-shirt face down on the U.S.-Mexican border. You've never heard that story, you've never seen that picture. But you've all seen the picture of a three-year-old little boy face down in a red t-shirt named Ailan Suri. You might not recognize the name Ailan Suri, but Ailan Suri is that picture you saw a couple of months ago of a little boy face down in a red t-shirt in the Mediterranean Sea. A little Syrian boy. It was all over the news, all over the internet. And he died because he was escaping persecution in Syria. And he came with his family. But why over there are they referred to as migrants and refugees, while over here some people call them illegals and anchor babies? They're all human beings. Hate words lead to hate actions. No human being is illegal. So you shouldn't call somebody an illegal alien or an illegal person because no human being is illegal. If I rob a bank, obviously I've committed an illegal act. Nobody's going to call me an illegal person. And when you use this type of terminology, and you're very familiar with other terminology that they've used to describe a particular race, ethnicity, uh, derogatory terms, it's to dehumanize the person. It's to dehumanize the person. Hate words lead to hate actions. So Marco Antonio Villaseñor dies crossing the U.S.-Mexican border. He's one of the 11,000 people. Lucrecia Dominguez is another one of the 11,000 people. She crossed for the number two reason people cross. The number two reason people cross is because they want to be with her family. Another universal human right. Many of you are in that situation. Many of you, one of your relatives came here first. And now they brought the family or the family came along later on. Well, Lucrecia Dominguez wanted to be with her husband. Her husband had a job, he was undocumented, he was working in Arizona. So she crosses the only way she can, also through the desert, and she hires a smuggler, a pollero, a coyote. And he says, I'm crossing a group tomorrow. You know, why don't you come with me? But whatever you do, don't bring those two little kids you have with you. She had her son, Jesus, 15 years old, and Nora, seven years old. And she says, why not? And they go, because when I cross tomorrow, if they come with us, they're gonna slow us down in the desert, and the border patrol might catch us. But her whole purpose was family reunification. So of course she brings them. She brings them, the smuggler gets mad, and he charges double. And he goes, if they slow us down, I'm gonna abandon them. And that's exactly what happened. The next day they're crossing with about 15 migrants, and as they're crossing, the children did slow down the group. So the smuggler says, ah, you're on your own. And he leaves Lucrecia and her two children. And Lucrecia Dominguez, the mother, the woman, she literally dies in the arms of Jesus, her 15-year-old son, Jesus. This is happening every day. Every day, 11,000 people have died crossing the U.S.-Mexican border 
the only way they can, through the desert, through the mountains, through the canal, through the ocean, and two people die every day. There's 250 million undocumented people in the world. 250 million. The United States only has 11 million because most people don't want to come here. They want to go to wherever there's an opportunity. We see our, our brothers and sisters from Syria, from the Middle East, from Africa. They're going into Europe. If you're in Asia, you're going to another part of Asia. If you're in South America, you're probably going to Brazil. If you're in Central America, many are going to Mexico. Some of them are going through Mexico to get to the United States. And if you're in Mexico, you're going to the United States. Now remember, my country, Mexico, the overwhelming majority of the population has no desire to leave Mexico. Why would you want to leave? You want to be with your family, your culture, your, your, your religion, your food, etc. So a very small percentage of the people that have been leaving, we are no longer the largest group of unauthorized migrants. Now it's people that are coming from Central America. The Mexican migration is actually going more towards Mexico than it is coming to the United States. More people are actually going back home because they came here to work or to be with their families and they're fed up with the, some of the situations that are going on. And I don't want to get into too much of the politics, but you've heard the presidential candidates on one particular party attacking Mexicans, saying derogatory uh, things. And when you say derogatory things, whether it's against Mexicans or our African-American brothers or veterans or women, there's, there's, there tends to be actions that take place. Hate words lead to hate actions. When Donald Trump made his comments about Mexicans, Two of the people that were in the audience almost killed a Mexican man in Boston. When he made, he, when, when they roughed up a protester that was saying black lives matter, and of course black lives matter, they threw him out. They threw him out, they beat him up. And all he was doing was making a statement which is true. We all come from Africa. Some of us are luckier than others because we have more African blood, but we all have African blood. We all came from Africa. We're all the same race, the human race. So. The Border Angels shifted its focus from just going to the canyons, where we started in 1986, to going to the desert in 1996, two years after the wall was built between the United States and Mexico. And at that time, I used to be in professional baseball. Uh, they're not professional anymore. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Uh, the San Diego Padres. I used to be with the San Diego Padres. So I started to go out there with some of the players, and we put water out in the desert. But we didn't have a name. We didn't have a name. It wasn't until my last year in professional baseball, which was 2001, that we got a name. And it was because I was invited to a television show that most of you have never heard of before. But it's the number one Spanish language show in the world, which just ended like a 50-year run a couple of weeks ago. Sábado Gigante with Don Francisco. So Don Francisco invites me to his show in Miami. I come out on the show, and when I walked out on the stage, Don Francisco says, El Ángel de la Frontera, the border angel. So that's how we got our name. All of a sudden, we're the border angels, and almost immediately, I started getting faxes and phone calls. The internet was pretty new then, and they started saying one of two things. One, I saw what you're doing, putting water in the desert, saving people's lives. I want to help. Or two, I need help. My brother crossed three weeks ago. We don't know what happened to him. My mother crossed two years ago. We don't know what happened to her. Those types of situations. So border angels went from a very small group to a very large group. We're more than 5,000 volunteers now. And we're an all-volunteer group. We're an all-volunteer group. So we do a lot of other things besides put water in the desert. If you look in your brochures, and, and some of you don't have a brochure, but we have some more on the table over there, we also go to the day labor sites. The day labor sites are, are where the guys, mostly guys, sometimes women, but mostly guys, stand in front of a Home Depot or a community center looking for work. They're standing there looking for work because that's why most of the people have come here. And people come by there and hire them because they go to the garden store or the paint store and they hire them and because they, they need somebody to help them do that work, right? Some of the people are undocumented, some are not. But regardless of whether they're documented or not, we go there to make sure they're okay. Have you found work lately? Did you get paid when you worked? When was the last time you saw your family? Did you know that we offer free uh, immigration attorneys every Tuesday at our office? You know, those types of things. So we do that on a regular basis. In your brochure, there's a picture and it's the biggest mass grave in the Americas. The biggest mass grave in the Americas is not in Argentina, it's not in Chile, it's not in Mexico, it's in the United States. Two hours from San Diego, as you go east towards Arizona, there's a county called Imperial County. And in Imperial County, there's a city called Holtville, H-O-L-T, Holtville. And there's a cemetery with 650 unidentified migrants buried there. 
That's what that picture is. 650 human beings that are unidentified. They've closed it. They don't want people to bring more attention to it, but we have permission to go there every other month. And we go there and we have a funeral mass, or we do prayer, or we do reflection. And we go with our brothers and sisters that are Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Sikhs, atheists. All are welcome. All are welcome. Because we're not a religious group or a faith-based group. And we do different types of uh, ceremonies there to remember them because it could have easily have been us that simply were crossing because they wanted to live. And they died in the Imperial Valley Desert. Or they drowned in the All-American Canal. Or they got hit by a car. Or the hate groups that have been out there. Thank God there's not as many anymore, but they're still out there. Uh, there was a group that was started back in 2005 that some of you are familiar with called the Minutemen. The Minutemen is a, is, a, is a hate group that was started in Arizona April 1st of 2005. And 2005 was also a watershed year because that fall of 2005, the Republican Congress passed a new law, or tried to pass a law, called House Resolution 4437, H.R. 4437. It was like 187, but it was national. It would deny the children of undocumented people these types of services that I talked about. They wanted to build a wall all the way from San Diego to Brownsville instead of just one-third of the border, the entire border. And I've got to admit, had that wall been built, 9-11 would have happened exactly the way it still happened. It wouldn't have stopped anybody. So anyways, um, you had these, these hate groups called the Minutemen that were actually going to the border with guns, and they were shooting migrants, or they were arresting migrants. They're not law enforcement. They have absolutely no right to be doing that, and they were doing that. So we went out there to expose them. We went out there to expose them and say, these are hate groups. That's not what this country or this world's all about. If they're so serious about this issue, have them join the Border Patrol. The, the Border Patrol is not going to shoot people, but at least they're in law enforcement and they, they pretty much know what they're doing. So in, on February 2nd of 2006, I got both groups together. Gente Unida, the group that was created to expose these hate groups, like the Minutemen, and to expose hate talk, like we still see today with some people on the air like Bill O'Reilly or Lou Dobbs. Lou Dobbs used to be one of the main guys on CNN, and we started a campaign to get rid of him. And thank God we were successful. Lou Dobbs is no longer promoting his hate on CNN. Now he's where he belongs. He's on Fox News. But anyways, so on uh, February 2nd of 2006, at Friendship Park, which is also in your brochure, we did, uh, I made a big announcement there, and I said, we're going to go across the country. We're going to go across the country and let people know what's going on. Friendship Park is what you saw in the video. That wall where you saw the children, that's on the San Diego side. There was also pictures of children on the Mexican side. That's where Operation Gatekeeper began. So you have Tijuana on one side and San Diego on the other, and the Pacific Ocean right next to it. So I go there and I say, well, we're going to go across the country. We want people to know what's going on about the wall, the deaths on the border, these crazy laws, the, the Minutemen hate groups. Does anybody want to come with me? We have no money. We're a faith-based group. We don't know where we're going to stay. We don't know who's going to feed us. Just come on faith. Faith without works is dead. Come on faith. 110 cars came with us. We had a 111 car caravan from San Diego to Washington, D.C. and back. 40 cities, 27 days, 20 states. When we came back, we held a press conference and we said we've been across the country. We've been talking to communities across the country and we've said stand up, rise up and protest. Peaceful protest. Let's, let's, let's ask for humane immigration policies. Well, on March 10th, they go, we're going to do it. We're going to do it in, in Chicago. 400,000 people took to the streets. On March 25th in Los Angeles, 800,000 people. On April 1st in San Diego, we had 100,000 people. There was marches, oh, April 9th in San Diego. We had marches all over the country. Three and a half million people took to the streets. The biggest marches in the history of the United States. The May 1st marches started up again. So now every February 2nd, we do Marcha Migrante, which is a, really a caravan called Marcha because the first one was to get people to march. On the fifth one, a woman came with me. Some of you may know her. She's a playwright. She wrote a play called Real Women Have Curves, which later became a movie. Her name is Josefina Lopez. So Josefina Lopez came with me, and I shared stories with her the whole way. So she came up with a new play. It's called Detained in the Desert. And Detained in the Desert is now a movie. It's not a, a, a documentary. It's a movie. So there's, you know, there's people that are actors in it and so forth. Has anybody here heard of uh, Brad Pitt? You guys have heard of Brad Pitt? He's not in it. I just want to know if you heard of him. But, but anyways, so Detained in the Desert is actually a movie. It's actually a movie. I just showed it in Washington, D.C. to Congress to tell people what's going on. There's an evil character in there named Lou Becker that represents Lou Dobbs and Glenn Beck. And then there's a good character in there. 
So it talks about the realities of what's taking place along the border. Every February 2nd, we do Marcha Migrante. Why February 2nd? February 2nd is actually a religious date, and it's a historical date. It's a religious date, 40 days after Christ's birth, when he's presented to the temple. We celebrate that in Mexico quite a bit. You know, you get the Rosca de Reyes, you get the little Jesus figure, you have to make tamales. Uh, February 2nd. But it's also a historical date. When the United States invaded Mexico in what's called one of the most unjust wars in the history of the world, they invaded Mexico for one purpose, manifest destiny, that this country had the right to take land, that this country had the right to take land, so they took half of Mexico, California, Arizona, Texas, uh, New Mexico, parts of Utah, etc. So on February 2nd, that's when the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, 1848. So on February 2nd, we do Marcha Migrante every year, February 2nd. We've done 10 of them. But we do a lot more than that. We in Mexico celebrate Children's Day on April 30th. You don't have that holiday here. But April 30th is Children's Day in Mexico. So Friendship Park, that park that I've talked about, there's the wall, and there's also an emergency door there. And I convinced the Border Patrol to open up that emergency door on Children's Day. And I said, why don't we open up that door just for two minutes and let, you know, we'll walk through there and, and maybe two children will hug or something like that as a symbol of love has no borders. And the Border Patrol said, that's a good idea, let's do it. So I said, okay. So when we did it the first time, all of a sudden this guy comes running up and he goes, aren't you Enrique Morones? And I go, yeah. And he goes, my daughter's over there on the Mexican side. I've never hugged my daughter. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, I've never hugged my daughter. I couldn't, you know, for me it was kind of hard to comprehend that. So I said, Luis, just stand next to me. Just stand next to me when they open the door. I'll make sure you hug your daughter today. We only had two minutes. So when they opened up the door, and I was going to walk through and say a few words, this little girl, five years old, Jimena, it's on our website. She goes running up, and she jumps in her dad's arms. And for two minutes, they hugged. She was, she was five years old. He's like 25 years old. And uh, none of us could speak. We were so emotional to see that. You know, just can't imagine. You never hugged your daughter before. So they're hugging, and I'm thinking, you know, we need to do this every single year. So every single year now on Children's Day, we've convinced the Border Patrol to open up that emergency door. This year we did it for 15 minutes, and there was children that were able to hug their parents or their grandparents. In, in almost every case, they haven't seen their parents or their grandparents in a long time. It wasn't as unique as that first one, but they've never been able to hug and so forth. So it's very emotional because love has no borders. Love has no borders. So the Border Angels does a lot of things on, at Friendship Park. We have the, the Mass for La Virgen de Guadalupe on December 12th, which is the, the, the day of the Virgen de Guadalupe. And we're going to have a binational Mass on both sides of the border. Last summer, in July, you might remember the images. I was there. The images of three buses of, of refugee children from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala being taken to a detention facility in Murrieta, California, an hour north of San Diego. And as the buses arrived there, the Murrieta police blocked the buses. And I go, what are you doing? I go, there's protesters right there. They're going to get in front of the buses. They're screaming and all that. And they go, we know what we're doing. And I go, yeah, what you're doing is, is, is not very smart. So what happened was the protesters, there was about 50 of them, they did get in front of the buses. They started banging the American flag against the buses and screaming at these little kids, five- and six-year-old little, little kids who don't speak English, but they understand hate. And I was going, these people are leaving a situation where if they don't, if they don't leave, they might not wake up tomorrow in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala because of the gangs, because a lot of the U.S. policies back in the 70s and the 80s, these are the grandchildren of these kids. And they're coming here seeking refuge. And that's the way they're being welcomed? If those kids on the buses were Canadian, you would have let them right in. And the police chief goes, are you implying racism? And I go, let me be clear with you. I'm not implying it. I'm stating it. And sure enough, um, the, pre the protesters did their thing. So I said, send them to San Diego, we'll take them in. So the three buses came back to San Diego, 100 children and, and some of their moms, and we took them in. We took in over 100 families. And, and then we did a concert that weekend because a, a guy called me named Demian Bishid. He's an actor in, from Mexico that lives in, in Los Angeles. He came out in a movie which I strongly recommend called A Better Life. It was a award, he was nominated for an Academy Award. But he's also the guy that used to come out in The Bridge, some, some television show. And he said, I saw what you did, I want to join you. And I go, we're going to do another action on Sunday. On Sunday, this is July of last year, I'm going to have the San Diego Symphony on one side of the wall and the Baja California Orchestra on the other. Once again, love has no borders. Because these acts, people see these acts and they say, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that there's a wall. I didn't realize that there's children that have never hugged their parents. I didn't realize that people that have fought for this country, like Hector Barajas, a veteran from Iraq, had a broken taillight and he got deported. 
He doesn't even speak Spanish. And he's living in Mexico now going, that's not what this country is all about. People don't know about these things. So we do different activities to bring awareness to these issues because we're all the same race, the human race. And one of my meetings, and I, and I um, have been very fortunate to meet with President Obama, even though we're a nonpartisan group, faith-based group, I as an individual, U.S. citizen, born in San Diego, you know, I could do whatever I want. So as an individual, I worked on both of Senator Obama's campaigns, and I'm very proud that I did. So anyways, one time when I was meeting with the president, we're in his office, and all of a sudden he goes, Enrique, don't forget, before we were us, we were them. Before we were us, we were them. He was re referring to the, the, the migrants, right? And I go, Mr. President, that's very true, but in your case and in my case, it's a little different. Because those of, of us that came from Africa, as far as our parents, grandparents, or ourselves, or whatever, uh, well, actually, it wouldn't be our parents or great-great-grandparents, were brought here by force. So you're really not migrants, you were brought here by force. And those of us that are Mexican, our land was taken by force. So we're not really migrants. But the rest of the country today, today still, in 10 years it'll be different. Today still, the majority of the country is of European ancestry, like many of you. And the largest group of those Europeans are from Germany. And there's a guy that all of you know. As a matter of fact, um, like it or not, hopefully you, you're lucky enough to, to have this, you have your, his picture in your wallet. And that person used to say, those people don't want to speak English, send them back. They only want to wave their own flag, send them back. They only want to hang out in their own neighborhood, send them back. I'm talking about Benjamin Franklin on the $100 bill. That's why the picture. Benjamin Franklin, a founding father of this country, he used to say that about Germans. The Germanization of this country, send them back. Many of you have German ancestry. Had he been successful, you wouldn't be here. So this discrimination has been going on since the founding of this country. Had Benjamin Franklin been successful, Frederick Trump never would have come here. That's Donald Trump's grandfather. So before we were us, we were them. And we see it being played out every single day with the terrible persecution of our African-American, predominantly male brothers. We see it being played out today with the way that we're treating our Muslim brothers and sisters. We're all one race, we're all one, you know, we should all be united on this effort. That's why I opened up by greeting you in Arabic because, hey, there's nothing wrong with being Muslim, Catholic, Jew, atheist, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, people have the right, have the right to choose their religion. Nobody supports violent acts and all that type of stuff. That's extremism. You know, one of the biggest extremist acts in this country was committed by a, a Christian, Timothy McVeigh. He didn't cross any borders, he was born here. So when they try to, to do that, pin these issues on one particular race or religion, it's wrong. And we've got to be very careful about that. We've got to be very careful. Uh, that's not what this country or this world's all about. So the Border Angels, our mission, as I mentioned many times, is on the front of the brochure. But we truly believe that the only way that you overcome hate is with love. And darkness is with light. There was a guy that came and spoke at my school. And I'll, send, I'll close with this story so maybe we can take some questions. And all of you know his grandfather. His grandfather is Mahatma Gandhi. So Gandhi's grandson comes to my school at the University of San Diego. And he gives a speech. It's a very powerful speech. Some of you have heard it. It's about a man walking along the beach with his son. And as he's walking along the beach with his son, his son is picking up these starfish. And he's throwing these starfish into the ocean. So the father says to the son, what are you doing? And he goes, dad, I'm picking up these starfish and throwing them into the ocean. And the father says, yeah, I can see that, but, but why are you doing that? And he goes, dad, it's so hot out here and the sun is so bright and the tide has gone in that these starfish are dying. They're dying. And he says, yes, son, but there's thousands of starfish. You do doesn't make any difference. And the little boy picks up a starfish and he shows it to his father. And he says, it'll make a difference to this one. It'll make a difference to this one. If that starfish wasn't a starfish, but it was a person, maybe that person could have saved Marco Antonio Villasenor, the five-year-old boy. Or Ailan Suri, the three-year-old boy. Or Lucrecia Dominguez, the mother that died in the arms of Jesus. The power of one, the power of one. Right after I heard that story, I was still with the San Diego Padres, and we're out in the desert putting water. And all of a sudden, I'm with another volunteer, and in the distance, I see this guy walking through the desert. Rarely do we see the people, because they usually cross at night. But this time, I did see one of the guys, and, and there was, you know, as, as I approached him, I realized there was two guys, because he was carrying somebody on his back. So the guy on his back was almost dead. So my friend and I, we grabbed the two people, and we put them under some trees for shade, 
and we start giving him water. And I'm about to take the guy that's really sick to the hospital in, in Calexico, which is on the U.S. side. And his friend goes, no, 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 the Border Patrol. And I go, forget about the Border Patrol. We don't want this guy to die. And I thought, well, let's, let's see how he responds to the water. So I started giving him some water. He started responding right away. So we stayed with him for three or four hours. They were in a safe place. And then we went on. We went on because we had to put water in other areas. Well, two weeks later, I get a call at Qualcomm Stadium. That's where the Padres used to play. And it's a little boy. And he goes, sir, you don't know me, but my name is Francisco. And two weeks ago, you saved my dad's life. And I said, oh, how's your dad doing? And he goes, oh, he's fine. We live in Los Angeles. My grandmother died, and my dad went to bury her. And he came back because, you know, he's, he's the one that, that provides for the family. And I go, well, I'm glad he's doing okay. How about your dad's friend, the guy that he was carrying? And Francisco says, what friend? I go, your dad didn't tell you? Your dad was carrying? You mean that guy was a stranger? He was carrying somebody on his back that he didn't even know. Talk about our faith. I mean, this guy was carrying a stranger on his back, realizing that by carrying that guy, he might get caught by the border patrol. It might be a lot easier to get caught, you know, carrying somebody on his back. And two weeks after the initial call from Francisco, I get a call from Pedro. It was the son of the man on the back. And he was calling me from Chicago. The same thing. Uh, thank you. My dad's fine and so forth. So when people say, do you think Border Angels makes a difference? I always say, I don't know. But it sure made a difference to Francisco and Pedro. And like I said at the beginning, you know, the, the person that really is going to make a difference in all of these issues, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, and make sure you get out there and vote. You know, we've got a big election coming up next year. The most important election probably in your lifetimes is going to be next November. Um, so when people say, do you think it makes a difference? And I go, well, it sure made a difference to Francisco and Pedro. Because that person, as I mentioned, that makes the difference in the world is that person you look at in the mirror every day. You know, we can make a huge difference. There was, there was a, a, a young lady that I was going to bring here to, to, to speak with me, but she wasn't able to make it. She wasn't able to make it. She was also an immigrant. She was from Ireland. She went to school in Boston. And the kids used to make fun of her because of her accent. And they would tease her all the time because, you know, this bullying situation is just totally out of control. And so one day, she was a, a little younger than you. She was a senior in high school. So one day, she didn't show up to school. So her teacher called her parents and said, how come Phoebe didn't show up to school today? And she goes, uh, oh, no, she went to school. No, she never showed up. So the teacher goes to the house, and they go, no, she never showed up. So they go into her bedroom to see, uh, you know, what was going on. Maybe there's something on her computer. They never looked at her computer. She hung herself from the rafters, committed suicide. This is happening every day. Hate words lead to hate actions. What you might think is funny, it's not funny. People don't like to be bullied. And whether it's our Muslim brothers and sisters, or, or, or people that are gay, or people that are a different color, different size, they're our brothers and sisters. And an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. And that's why it's important that we speak out, you know, that we don't remain in silent. That we don't remain silent. So that's the Border Angel story. Um, I really appreciate the fact that I had a chance to, to share it with you. And we're looking for people to join us. We have in-service uh, groups that come, students come from different schools across the country, and they spend three or four days with us. A lot of them do it during spring break. I've talked to some of the people here that work at the school. Or we have people that say, hey, I want to start a club here in, in, uh, in Connecticut. And you can do that as well. It could be a club that already exists, because there's a lots of work to do. And, and uh, I know that uh, some of you are here because maybe it's the last chance you get for certain credit for your class, whatever. But the important thing is that you're here, and hopefully something you heard will inspire you to next time you see somebody that you're thinking about doing something that isn't so nice, you do the right thing. You do the nice thing, you know, whether anybody's watching or not. So with that, I'm going to close. But before I close, before I close, some people might say, hey, yeah, I'm really interested in helping, but I don't know. Uh, I can't go to San Diego. Well, we have uh, ways that you can help us. With, we have these little uh, books that are the Stations of the Cross. I only got like four or five of these. And it's stories uh, about the migrants and prayers. It was done by a friend of mine from the University of Notre Dame, Father Kim. We asked for a $5 donation on these. We also have some bracelets and some crucifixes that were made by dreamers. Dreamers are students like the children, like the children I talked about. These are students that are a little older, but they also were brought across the border by their parents. They're also undocumented. They live most of their lives in the United States. And remember, this immigration issue is not just about Latinos. Of the 11 million undocumented people that are here, more than a third are from other parts of the world that, aren't, that don't speak Spanish. They seem, to, they seem to always say it's Mexicans or Latinos. No, it's not true. It's not true. There's undocumented people from all over the world here. 
And these are people that have lived most of their lives here. Maybe they were brought here when they were two years old or three years old. Some of them don't speak the language of their parents. And they want to go to college. And they can't. Because they don't have, they're realizing later in life that they're undocumented. They can't get that student aid that a lot of us receive. That's how I was able to go to USD, the Catholic University. That's how a lot of you are able to go to this school. The student aid, the scholarship, and so forth. So there's dreamers, they have a dream. They have a dream to continue with their education to give back to this country because they love this country and they should. And they love the country of their roots and they should. So we need to do something about it. Well, these bracelets and crucifixes were made by dreamers. These are also $5. I've got a book. It's called The uh, Border Angel Story, The Power of One. These are $20. And we got them over there on the, on the table right over there. And we take PayPal and credit cards and checks and all that kind of good stuff. And then we got these t-shirts. So the t-shirt has the logo of the Border Angels on the front. And then we have a huge campaign that we're doing now. I just came back. I've been over to Syria and Europe and so forth because we do our work all over, not just in, on the U.S.-Mexican border. And on the back it says, Welcome migrants. Bienvenidos migrantes. Si se puede. Yes, we can. Because like I said, only love will overcome hate. And uh, so hopefully you'll, you'll join us and support us. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias.